So today's class will be kind of the a, a, a hand wavy motivation stuff, okay? Which I think is uh, important. Because if you don't know why you're studying something, then why would you study it, right? So why groups? So my one line answer to that, that eventually groups crop up in every field of physics and mathematics. Okay, so eventually, groups crop up everywhere in physics and mathematics, okay? And beyond, you know, groups are also being used in computer science. Well, computer science is really mathematics, so it's not so surprising. Uh, so yeah, uh, now historically, as far as I know, uh, groups came from trying to solve the algebraic equation, quintic, uh, the, like the quintic or higher polynomial equations, right? And that is the subject of Galois theory. Some of you here have done Galois theory, I think. And, you know, yes, uh, yeah, and Galois, you know, kind of died in a stupid um, duel at a very young age. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the, we, that's how, we, and I think also uh, in the study of permutations, groups also arose in the study of permutations. And this is something that we are, it's important for physics because um, of particles, when you have, you know, in physics, in, ther in thermodynamics, in statistical physics, in uh, quantum mechanics, you know, you're counting stuff. And when we're counting stuff, you have to consider permutations. Okay, so, um, so that's how historically groups, you know, uh, raise their very beautiful head because I think groups are very beautiful. They're very nice objects. They're not horrible at all. They're just the, one of the, some of the most amazingly, uh, you know, regular things, even though this is outside the scope of this class, but I would encourage you to look at it. You know, this class, we will be mostly concentrating on continuous groups, uh, you know, so we will be uh, concentrating on continuous groups. And these are also known as Lie groups. But when you think of the discrete groups and the finite discrete groups, uh, there are some weird things that happen. And the weirdest of them all is called the monster. Okay. Or the monster group. And the number of elements in the monster group is roughly equivalent, equal to the number of atoms in the earth. So, and its representation, uh, the monster group's representation have a lot of application in the field of modular forms in mathematics. So I encourage you to look at that because it's such a fun topic, but it'll be outside the scope of this class. Okay, so, you know, let's not get, um, you know, too distracted. So let's come back. Oh yeah, Otonu has posted in the chat a video about the monster from Three Blue One Breath. Okay. So, uh, so the fact that the monster group, uh, you know, the that modular forms furnish representation of the monster group was essentially a set of conjecture. And that set of conjecture was um, called the monstrous moonshine. 
conjectures. And they were made by uh, famous mathematician, John Conway, okay? And John Conway died, I think a couple of years ago, we, you know, I think he died of COVID. And he was just this very amazing, like he was just a very, uh, a great mathematician and a funny man. You may know of the Game of Life, which is a computer program. It's not a computer program, it's a game. It's what is known as a cellular automaton. Uh, so he invented the game of life, but he also made the conjecture that modular forms, uh, you know, that modular forms you know, furnish a representation you know, of the monster group. Now, this remained unproven until um, a British mathematician, I think he's British, uh, uh, proved it. And uh, his name was, his name is Richard Borchardt. He's still alive. And for that, he also got the Fields Medal. And when I first started my PhD at Cambridge, Richard Borchardt taught a Lie algebra and Lie groups, Lie algebra course. And everyone knew that he was going to get the Fields Medal the next year. So everyone just like piled into this one room to hear from Richard Borchardt what he thought about Lie groups. And uh, yeah, and then he got the Fields Medal the next, next year. And Richard Borchardt used uh, something called vertex algebra. A vertex algebra is related, is, is, is very closely related to uh, something called the kind of groups used in string theory called loop groups, okay? So their vertex algebra arose, you know, from the mathematics, of string theory, okay? So that's the story of the monster. So groups are very useful objects, okay? So this is what I'm gonna say, groups are very useful. And the thing is that why do they arise? They arise because you know, they uh, describe often the symmetry or the symmetries of some you know, mathematical or physical system, okay? So this is what makes groups so uh, useful. Now, in this course, you know, we are going to use a certain uh, connections that group have with matrices. So, you know, groups themselves are abstract objects in you know, groups are abstract objects. But every group <coughs> you know, can be represented by matrices. So this is the subject. So this connection uh, or, you know, they um, should say this is the subject.
of representation theory. Okay, so, so what is representation theory? Representation theory is the theory of how, just one second. Representation theory is the theory of how to represent groups uh, as uh, in terms of matrices, okay? Now often, you know, often, you know, uh, the most important part of solving a physics problem or a related math problem is to figure out you know which representation is appropriate okay the rest is kind of uh, easy okay any uh, any question? Okay, so the connection between uh, you know the connection. So sorry, uh, can someone speak up? Because I'm not sure if uh, turning on the do not disturb mode is going to affect. Uh, okay. Um, can someone speak up? Unmute themselves. Uh, uh, yes, sir. You're audible. Sir. Okay. Awesome. So somebody has asked a question. What are some other representations? Okay. Uh, okay. So usually representation theory means that suppose you have a group and there will be an infinite number of representation in terms of matrices. Okay, so if you have some group, say G, and then you'll have a representation of this group, at, and let's call it represent M1 matrices. So this is a set of matrices. And there'll be, and there'll be another group, which is going to be M2. Okay, another sorry, representation, okay. So uh, in principle, every group has an infinite number of representations. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. And you know, we'll see very like, we'll see examples of this, right? So, okay, uh, Nahi is asking, can we always, mathematically jump from one rep to another. Uh, what do you mean jump? Like unitary transfer? No, we cannot. Um, the, they will be different dimensions. There are equivalent representation. There are inequivalent representation. If two representations are inequivalent, you cannot, you cannot transform from one to the other. Okay. So the, the connection between uh, you know representations and, and and you know matrix matrix representation and groups is very deep. So in fact, many groups are defined are defined in terms of matrices. And this is the so-called fundamental representation of the defining, I think it's called the defining representation. 
So there are there are groups which are defined in terms of a set of matrices. And there are other matrices which are representation of that group. Okay, we shall see examples of all of this. Right? Okay, so, so this is the motivation. And uh, let me just give you a very quick uh, like list of applications of groups. 